Mr. Danielson will be fit filming us today. Uh, so thank you for being here, Bruce. My name is Chris Parsley. I'm president of Falls Area Bicyclists. We are the nonprofit advocacy organization for bicyclists in Sioux Falls. I'm also certified by the League of American Bicyclists as a cycling instructor. I'm here speaking on behalf of the bicycling community in Sioux Falls. According to the police department, as of last Thursday, 18 drivers have been ticketed for illegal turns on a red light at 10th and Minnesota Avenue so far in 2017. Last Thursday, I did some data collection of my own. I set up a GoPro camera for an hour and I filmed people turning right off of Minnesota onto 10th Street for one hour. During that time, 119 drivers turned right. 17 of those turned while the light was red. Six of those 17 did not come to a complete stop. Five of those six turned while pedestrians were present at the intersection. One was a City of Sioux Falls sewer vacuum truck. The pedestrian actually had to run to get out of the way of a large yellow truck with the logo of our city on the side of it. Not one of the 17 that turned right on red even gave so much as a cursory glance to the right to check and see if there was any traffic on the sidewalk. Their heads did not even begin to turn to the right until they were almost halfway around the corner. Two of the drivers who turned this corner, one on a red, one on a green, didn't look in either direction. They were looking down at their phones while turning right. This was one hour in one day at one intersection. One has to imagine this isn't an isolated problem for 10th and Minnesota. People's lives are at stake here. Three of the last five people killed while bicycling in Sioux Falls were hit by right-turning motorists looking to their left before turning right. And in 2003, a pedestrian was killed at this very intersection where I filmed. Some people cannot drive cars. Maybe they made poor choices. Maybe they have a medical condition that prevents them from operating a motor vehicle. Whatever the reason, walking or riding a bicycle is their mode of transportation. They have places to be, people to meet, and things to do. Just like the rest of us driving motor vehicles, they should be able to travel safely to their destination. It was demonstrated recently by the City of Sioux Falls that convenient motor vehicle travel is much more important than pedestrian or bicyclist safety. It's been reported that the changes made to the signage at this intersection, this one intersection in town, is going to save drivers an average of 22 seconds. There's a cheaper and much more effective alternative. Set your alarm one minute earlier. Every one of us has seen that other driver looking at their phone while driving. If you haven't seen it, then you need to put the phone down. Most, if not all of us, have turned right. Many of us on the way here tonight. And how many of you did not look to the right before stepping on the gas pedal? Many times, nothing bad happens. But when something does happen, it's usually really bad. Pedestrians and bicyclists are vulnerable road, road users and they never fare well when they tangle with someone driving a motor vehicle. I ask the leadership of Sioux Falls to think beyond saving drivers 22 seconds. I would rather see my tax dollars spent on stronger traffic enforcement. If you're gonna make a change that saves drivers time and keeps pedestrians safe, then follow through with what you say. What I filmed last week on Thursday at this one intersection for one hour on one day is a recipe for disaster. And I hope something changes before someone gets hurt or worse, killed. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Remember me? My name is Patrick Lally. I'm host of the Patrick Lally Show on KSOO, Information 1000. And uh, I've been talking about this issue since the news first broke last week. And uh, I'm as disturbed now as I was then. Um, about the taking down the uh, uh, no turn on red or putting up the pedestrian when pedestrians are present signs and changing the policies there. And uh, the reason I'm disturbed on a personal level is I was an Argus Leader employee in 2003 when Edie Adams was killed. And that was 14 years ago. And I think we've forgotten what that moment was like um, in broad sense. But I tell you, the people who work there that day have not forgotten because they've been in contact with me. And they've sent me very many impassioned notes about what they remembered about Edie and what they remembered about that day. And 
the number of people walking across that street has gone down because the number of people working at the Argus Leader is fewer. The number of people working in the Quest building next door is fewer. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow somebody won't buy the Quest building and put a bunch more employees back in there. And it doesn't mean that there aren't people down there. And I would submit to you that this intersection is like any other section in this town. It's in a neighborhood. And yes, it's the intersection of two state highways. And yes, they're both major thoroughfares for our community. But I will tell you that it's a neighborhood. Just like the cul-de-sac in your neighborhood, just like the quiet street in McKinnon Park or Tut Hill or Hilltop or West Sioux or the North End or anywhere else. It's a neighborhood and it's full of kids and it's full of people doing their business. And I worked down there for 18 years and I saw people driving the wrong way every day. I saw cars spinning around that corner every day. I saw people that I know get hit and not killed. Very recently an Argus Leader employee was knocked down to the point where he needed an ambulance at that corner. And yes, it's only one intersection in one part of our city. But a woman died at the same spot where we held a press conference to announce it. And that's disturbing to a lot of people who knew Edie. But beyond that, this is a bigger question. This is a larger issue about planning and transportation. Why do we think we're the only city in the country that isn't changing, that isn't growing, that isn't morphing, where the young people are not as interested in driving cars, where mass transit is important, where walkability in all neighborhoods is important. I know a lot, of, I'm, I love this city. I was born here, I grew up here. My father, who I believe is here, was born here and grew up here. His father was born here and grew up here. My mother, her mother, and her grandmother, same thing. So when I say these things, it is from a great, place of love. And I want this to be a better place. And this one intersection in this one part of town isn't that big a deal, right? But what's it say about us going forward? It says that we only care about driving cars and that moving traffic is more important than safety. And why? Why is this happening now? Why? And who? Who made the decision? We I mean, I don't know. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people know. I'm not, you know, I'm not in City Hall. I, I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable explanation. And I saw the email from uh, Director Cotter that went out today, and it's full of a lot of really good stuff, really good stuff that's happening in this city. Man, I tell you what, the, the, the city led the state in terms of bike laws and bikeability. The city leads this area in a lot of great ways, but this is a step back and there's no other way to see it. And I, I just hope, my only point is, I hope going forward that we'll consider the ramifications of these decisions and what they mean in the big picture and not just one intersection in one part of the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on any topic of interest to you? Welcome. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Stephen Ciano. I've talked with you in the past, and uh, I've generally not made a good presentation, partly because, or much because of the physical side of my uh, disability. I've had trouble breathing, and which should have been noticeable, I would think, to this body, and standing is uh, difficult. But I also have... Uh, emotional and social disability uh, as of 1978, which has been covered up in an effort to uh, deny me uh, life-sustaining medical needs. This has been recently compounded. This has been on the federal, uh, state, um, county, local level. And uh, I've asked you people repeatedly to uh, do something about the locals. There are crimes being committed. In order to cover up the, uh, my actual condition and the situation, 
uh, people have committed fraud and defamed me, falsely depicting me as delusional so as to discredit me and my uh, charges. I have asked the police, I have asked the city attorneys, I have asked this body repeatedly to do something about it. I had police at my house where I was living, uh, concerned for my welfare, supposedly, and I told them what was going on. And I was told, well, you can go to DAV or a local attorney, private attorney. Well, excuse me, there's crimes going on here. You're a police officer. Why don't you investigate and prosecute, maybe arrest these people involved? People have reportedly stolen about $300,000 in my name. That's identity theft. While depriving me of any income for years, which was expected to cause my death and certainly did cause harm. I want this body to do something, not dismiss it as, oh, well, you need counseling. Oh, well, it's not our responsibility. Um, or, oh, we're, we get annoyed with such uh, reports. Oh, this is so tiresome. No, I know what I'm speaking of. I know the law. I know natural law. I know American law. I know the crimes being committed. And if you want to give me more time, you want to have a conversation, I can explain in more detail, as I have with your human relations people, who then claim to be not answerable to you, but to the federal government. Everyone's passing the buck, but as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. We're now down to the local level, and I say find some police, some prosecutor to take this on. People are committing, this constitutes attempted murder, and for you people to do nothing in light of this is horrendous. Thank you. Stephen, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Folks, uh, anybody else? Welcome. Mayor, Council, I'm Michael Christensen. Um, right turns are a problem. Um, you, Mayor, I read in the paper, said that we'd look to our left and we'd look to our right. Nobody is there, yet we still can't go. Um, Chief of Police says it's not the sign that makes a difference, it's not the light that makes the difference, it's them paying attention, them drivers, having their head on a swivel, seeing are there pedestrians. Um, and, and we know that drivers don't do that. Um, we know that when we're out walking with our wives in the evenings and going someplace with any traffic volume that you come to the driver who's turning right and they're looking that way and they're not looking over here at you and you take out your five guys burgers and fries and put it on their hood and unwrap your burger and take a bite and you, they still haven't noticed you there. Um, and so we know drivers don't do that. In fact, my own father's experience at 43rd in Minnesota as he stood on the corner waiting to cross um, he knew that the driver first in line wasn't looking at him, so he waited, but he didn't realize that the driver second in line also wouldn't take the time to notice him, and they took a different line and knocked him over there. Um, I uh, was working um, at the same place that the driver that turned right out of our driveway going to launch onto 49th Street killed Natasha Adams while she crossed her path on her bicycle. Um, that, too, was a driver was my coworker looking down the street that way, but turning this way and not looking here. Um, you hear drivers say they came out of nowhere, and that tends to be what that thing is, where they're looking over here and not noticing what's to their right. Um, Chris said three of, the last car, three of the last five car bike fatalities have been right-turning drivers. Um, the last two were cited, failure to exercise due care, because they didn't look to their right. Um, I have the 60 crash reports report given to the state, um, Sioux Falls crash reports, 60 car bike crash reports that happened in 2014 and 2015, that's two a month, right? 42% of them are drivers turning right. All the rest is everything else that could possibly happen to a bike rider and a car. Um, I don't have pedestrian data because we paid $360 to get these, me and a couple of friends, and you know, I'm just a poor bike rider, so I couldn't afford that. 
Um, finally, just the last piece is uh, this summer, spring, um, Chris and I trained your sewer area metro drivers and staff um, because a bike bus driver incident was reported to them and the management reviewed the video and saw something that scared them so much that they needed to do more. When we teach bicyclists and drivers about safe driving around bicyclists, we say the worst thing you can do is ride your bike on the sidewalk facing traffic because of that driver that's turning right, looking left, and not noticing you. And the, the proximity is so close that there's not time to make any adjustments. So fatalities happen there. Um, when we gave that message to the bus drivers, look right before you turn right. Um, the management was very interested in that and very glad that we brought that message from our perspective because they have drivers with that issue. So while this, yes, is a small decision, it's a larger issue, more intersections that could find this, have these changes made, leads to more trouble. And so um, I'm here with my friends lamenting the decision and hoping that these facts can adjust future decisions. Thank you. Michael, thank you as well. And Council, I was gonna let you know, even though there's been some similar topics on Right on Red, I think it's been unique for the most part, uh, different aspects on the topic, so hope you don't mind. Um, folks, other topics uh, or other comments? Very good, welcome. Scott Harrisman, Sioux Falls. Um, first thing, I got a couple things here. First thing I want to talk about is the recent email I got this week about the easements that are going to be approved for the Arc of Dreams and the building permits. I'm still befuddled and still struggling with the fact that a nonprofit in Sioux Falls would commission a $1.6 million sculpture um, from a internationally known sculpture artist before ever getting one lick of approval from the city. Ponder that. My next thing is uh, I saw at the informational today that uh, we're gonna be paying off the Lewis and Clark bond early. That's awesome. I'm gonna save about $25 million. I was against that bond to begin with. I thought it was foolish to spend $70 million to get 10% of our water through a pipe. I also felt at the time, I think I had a long discussion with Councilor Staggers at the time, that the federal government should be helping to pay for this. Um, ironically, about three years ago, I was at a political event up in Minneapolis and I ran into Senator Al Franken, who at the time was uh, trying to get money for Lewis and Clark for Minnesota and Iowa. And I was explaining to him about how the city of Sioux Falls took out a $70 million bond without any federal money to basically bail Lewis and Clark out because I can tell you, if they wouldn't have got that $70 million from us back then, Lewis and Clark would have been in a whole world of hurt. Um, so I guess it's good that we're paying it off. But one thing that concerned me today was that we have $36 million sitting in a reserve fund for the enterprise funds. We have been told over the past 10, 15 years, increase water rates, increase water rates, increase water rates, increase water rates. Why? because we need it for infrastructure. We need to upgrade all these water pipes. We need to fix all these streets. We need to do all this stuff. And what did we do with all these water increases? We stuck it in a savings account. $36 million worth of money that could have went back into our economy sat in a savings account. That is really misguided. And we were, and we were lied to. I mean, we were lied to. We kept we're told that we needed this money for infrastructure, and we stuck it in a savings account. Speaking of lies, my last topic here. You probably saw the news this week about how uh, the parks director denied that uh, we, uh, we had a no-mo list. I guess it just it was all in their heads. They just memorized it or something. It was never on a piece of paper or, or in the computer or anything. Well, then they got caught that they actually did have a no-mo list. Now, this council and mayor like to praise city directors all the time about all the great work they do. And that's wonderful when they do a good job. But what happens when they don't do a good job? What happens when they lack integrity and lie to the public and lie to the media? They need to own up to that too and apologize. 
I believe the parks director owes the public an apology for lying. Doesn't matter what he lied about, but he lied. Thank you. Folks, anybody else? Item number five. Y'all come back now. Here. Uh, security, escort this gentleman out, please. Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. 